Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, if you are listening from elsewhere in the world or reflecting upon this, no doubt, a very fine event in the recording. My name is Martin Paprinskis. I'm a reader in public international law here at UCL Laws, and I'm also the chair of tonight's event on damages calculation. Let me make three broader points uh, before I get on to the introduction of the speaker. Damages calculation is an important and also problematic question for lawyers. As a public international, I am often struck by the recollection of one of the great historical legal controversies of international law, the standard of compensation under international law that preoccupied many of the greatest legal minds from 1930s till 1990s. So the question of what is the precise adjective for compensation that is right in international law, an enormous amount of intellectual energy devoted to that. And indeed, as we see nowadays, probably almost entirely wasted in terms of practical impact of resolution of actual disputes. So a takeaway about the importance, but also modesty of law. The second point is about the great importance of question of valuation in dispute settlement, be it litigation, commercial arbitration, or investor state arbitration in current disputes. Let me just give you two examples of, from recent investor state arbitrations, the field that I'm familiar with. Uh, in 2019, uh, Tethyan Copper and Pakistan and Conoco Phillips and Venezuela were both awards that rendered multi billion damages claims against respondent states. Claims that are hard to satisfy for any states, but probably particularly problematic for the particular state. So, valuation is something that is hugely important for dispute settlement, but also something that raises key public policy issues in many settings. And finally, that is something that one might think raises hard questions in the ever-changing world that we live in, particularly in the recent months and years, the questions about the impact on the assumptions of valuation by developments regarding climate change and the shift to legal energy in various legal settings. So these are just some of the reasons why I think today's talk is important both for technical lawyers, experts, and people interested in broader public policy themes. Let me now introduce our speakers, and we have quite a few speakers, so let me just explain, as it were, how the structure fits together. We will first have three speakers from HKA, a world-leading uh, firm providing expert specialist services of multidisciplinary character in various topics, including international uh, dispute settlement. Uh, the three speakers are Colin Johnson, who is a partner in HKA's Forensic Accounting and Commercial Damages Practice, Michael Lemming, who is an Associate Director in the same practice, and Rebecca Ruthven, who is a Qualified Chartered Accountant and a Senior Managing consult Consultant also in HKA's Forensic Accounting and Commercial Damages Practice. They will give the main presentation of tonight. Then we will have as a commentator, Sebastian Blomier, who is an English solicitor currently with Munich Re. Very happy to welcome Sebastian back as a UCL alumnus. Since then he has done many great things, including founding the Disputes Europe, Latin America, DELA network. So the roadmap is as following. I will give the floor to Colin and his team. Then Sebastian will provide comments that is all that I want to say at the moment. Colin, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Martins. And it's a pleasure to be back at UCL again, albeit virtually. Um, Martins and I were saying that this was originally scheduled for last uh, March, uh, but of course was one of the first things to get hit by the uh, COVID, uh, COVID factor, shall we call it. Um, but it's a delight to be here, even if it is in, in a virtual format for now. Uh, and the delay has also meant that I'm able to be joined 
by my colleagues, Michael Lamming and Rebecca Ruthven, uh, as Martins has already introduced. Martins talked about uh, damages being problematic for lawyers. And I think that was a very good choice of phrase. It's not comfortable territory for lawyers. And, and you know, as a, as a sweeping generalization, if you want to watch a lawyer's eyes glaze over very quickly, put an Excel sheet up on the screen. You'll be pleased to know there's no Excel sheets tonight. This is not aimed at teaching people to be uh, damages experts. What it's aimed at is some of the practical issues, particularly those issues where the legal team need to be aware that what they're doing can actually have a significant impact in terms of what the final damages figure are, uh, damages figures are, I should say, and how those interact together. So, so this will be practically focused, and you'll also be pleased to know that most of the time it won't be me that's doing the talking. So if we can just move down a slide, that's the three of us that you will see. You can see us all in the small boxes on the screen. Um, and you can also see our contact details there. Next, if we can move on the, the legal bit, as I call it, this is for training purposes. Um, so it's not to be taken for any other purpose, but I'll move on swiftly from that and get into the meat of this. What we're going to cover, at least if you don't mind going to the next slide, is the questions, who, what, when, where, how? Whose loss is it that we're calculating? What does that loss actually encompass? When is the actual valuation date or the claim period that we're talking about? Where does the dispute relate to? How is the loss calculated? And then some takeaways on the back of that. Uh, I don't think we'll have time this evening to go through some of the further case studies, but th that will give you hopefully a good starting point for thinking about some of these issues. And even for those who are a lot more familiar, hopefully some new thoughts to take away and consider. So if we can move on, uh, and when we get to the who, I pass you across to Michael. Thanks, Colin. So the who, whose loss are we calculating? Now, whilst in an ideal world, or at least in an ideal world in which disputes are risen, there'd be a simple contract between two standalone entities, which one party has breached and for which the other party suffered damages. In reality, that's not a particularly common occurrence. What's more common is something rather less clear. In terms of the who, that often means a dispute with a number of relevant parties, including those that have caused or contributed to the breach, those that have suffered as a result, and a number of other directly or indirectly linked parties that may be necessary to consider when preparing the claim and determining damages. And so in that sense, it's pivotal that this early review and analysis of the evidence is performed, that the dispute matters understood, that the party or parties who've suffered the loss are identified, and separately, as we'll discuss on the next slide, that the party or parties that are legally able to bring the claim for said losses are identified as well. So with that, let's take a look at some of the other aspects to consider when it comes to the who of damages calculations. Please, if you could pass on to the next slide. Thank you. First of all, whether or not any loss has been passed through to others by the claimant. So what I mean by this is whether the loss sits with the claimant or whether the claimant may actually be seeking to claim for a loss that it's managed to avoid for one reason or another be it because the loss is covered by an insurance policy or guarantee, be it because it's passed the loss onto another party in the chain, such as the end user, or be it because it's taken mitigating steps that have effectively reduced or avoided an element of the loss. So let's think about this in a practical example. Let's say a cartel has been found to have been selling prices at an artificially high rate, and one of its customers has suffered a loss as a result. Whilst in theory, the customer or claimant has suffered a loss that it can quantify in the form of the artificially high price as compared to what it should have been paying, if the claimant's been able to pass that price on to its own customers, then the loss no, long, no longer actually sits with it, rather it's passed through the loss. And whilst that's just one example, as I'll demonstrate in one of our own case studies on the next slide, it's, it's not a one-off and it basically serves to highlight the need to consider early on whether the loss in question actually sits with the claimant or whether it's been passed on to another party. Next up, should a different party be bringing the claim? Once again, this goes back to the, important as the importance of reviewing and analyzing the evidence and establishing not only the party or parties that have suffered the loss, but also the party or parties that are legally able to claim for said losses. In other words, to whom is the duty of care owed? And this will typically be found in the contractual documents. And now, whilst this might not seem too complicated, it, it often can be, and that's typically due to the existence of complex corporate structures. 
What this translates to is the challenge of trying to decipher between parent entities, subsidiaries, associates, joint ventures, special purpose entities or vehicles, with a number of these potentially involved in some way or another in the performance of the contract or project, and in turn, potentially subject to the effect of any act or breach of those, that contract or the project. And despite this being a particularly important aspect, in other words, determining who should be bringing the claim, it can often be overlooked. And on occasion, failing to consider it has created potential problems for parties. For example, where shareholders have sought and failed to claim for losses suffered in respect of an investment in a separate entity, such as a special purpose vehicle, or where claims have been transferred to another party within the corporate group, and it's been argued whether or not the titled claimant can actually bring a claimant from not a party to the breached contract. And this can also be a particular relevance from a strategic perspective in terms of deciding how to go about framing the claim or even how to set up the project or contract itself at the beginning. And this can depend on things such as the type of loss which may arise or has arisen, the parties this may impact or has impacted. And lastly, the existence of possible contractual limitations as to liability, types of damages and amounts that can be claimed by and against certain parties. Now, having discussed these two additional aspects before moving on to the what, as I mentioned before, let's just take a quick look at a case study of ours that illustrates the importance of understanding who the loss actually sits with. You can pass on to the next slide, Lisa. Thank you. So this case relates to the construction of a petrochemical plant, which due to issues with the main contractor was delayed in terms of its completion. And due to the delay in completion, an alternative source was required to be used for that period, which came at a higher cost. Now, whilst the cost of the alternative source were evidenced to have been incurred, which would in theory represent a loss to the claimant, it was observed that the cost of the additional source were in fact being compensated for via payment from the off-takers, who in this case also happened to be the shareholders of the claimant. So whilst there was an identifiable and quantifiable loss, given that it didn't sit with the claimant and had effectively been passed through, it was no, not considered as being reasonable to include in the claimant's claim. Further, as mentioned on the previous slide as to the who actually brings the claim, given that the claimant in this case was a special purpose vehicle and not the shareholders, these costs or losses relating to the alternative source essentially sat outside the bounds of the claim and were then afforded not recoverable within it, which again highlights the importance of the strategy in terms of how to frame the claim and which party or parties bring it. So there we have it, that's the who. I'll now pass on to Rebecca who'll speak about the what. Thanks, Michael. Um, next slide, please, Lisa. Okay, so we now know what to consider when identifying who has suffered the loss, but what is that loss? Is it a loss of value of a contract, business or investment? For example, an expropriation of an investment related to a breach in a bilateral investment treaty, the loss will be the value of that investment. Are we considering a loss of profits, be it reduced income or increased costs? For example, a breach of contract um, where a gas supplier fails to supply the appropriate quantities of gas under a contract to a refinery may result in increased costs for the refinery to mitigate and find alternative gas or, fu or fuels to meet the optimal production. Has the claimant incurred additional costs to date that cannot be recovered? This could be research costs in finding a solution to inadequate materials not performing as advertised and or labour costs in implementing those solutions or increased um, repair works, which we refer to as sunk costs. Could the claimant have yielded a greater return were it not for the, suffer the damage suffered? So is that a loss of, of an, on investment? Is it a loss of opportunity in investing in other projects or businesses instead? Or does it relate to de uh, delays involved in a construction contract, which sets out an agreed compensating amount payable as an example of uh, liquidated damages? And there's also a loss of reputation. So um, such as misuse of a company name associated to a wrongful act um, and damaging the brand. So these are all examples of basis of loss, which by no means an exhaustive list and claimant, the claimant or claimants could have and often do suffer more than one basis of loss. The important thing to note here is to consider that whether losses overlap and not to double count. For example, you cannot claim for the cost of an investment and the profits obtained from that said investment because this would put the claimant in a better position um, were it not for the wrongful act, thereby not achieving the purpose of damages, which in broad terms puts the claimant um, is the same to, is to put the claimant to the same position it were um, not for the wrongful act. So unfortunately, as it's quoted here, you cannot have your cake and eat it too. Next slide, please, Lisa. Thank you. Um, so what does value mean? And this slide is to um, provide a, a point of caution in terms of what people mean when they say value, as it can vary um, drastically um, and be defined differently. So 
are we referring to fair market value? This is most common in cases that we come across being the value assuming a willing buyer or willing seller where both have reasonable knowledge of the relevant facts. It could be value in use being the present uh, value of the cash flows in which that asset generates or book value, the difference between the assets and liabilities as recorded on the balance sheet of a company or replacement value. So how much would it cost to replace the asset like for like? It could be in reference to fire sale value, a value um, below um, market, well, well below market value, um, often seen when companies um, sell off stock when they're facing financial difficulties. Um, or it could be in reference to synergies, so where a combination of two companies results in a higher value than the sum of the values of those companies separately. So the value to a particular party is different to the market value because it could, for example, gain access to a new market through the other company which might not have been previously accessible. So when talking about value, um, people can mean very different things. It's important to be clear what is applicable in the case. Uh, next slide, please, Lisa. Thank you. So this is a, a quick case study to go through um, in relation to a construction case. So the background of the case is the claimant, the respondent entered into a joint venture agreement to tender for construction uh, contracts via a joint venture, also referred to as a JV, with equal shareholding. So, however, the respondent tendered for the construction contracts, which were ultimately awarded via a JV with the, complaint, with the um, claimant under an alleged unauthorised joint venture agreement instead. So this is where the shareholding of the claimant was considerably less than what was agreed, so it wasn't 50-50. In terms of the damages issues, we want to be looking at what is the loss suffered and are there multiple alternative base, bases of loss to consider? So firstly, the claimant has suffered a loss of profits from the contracts awarded as a proportion of profits attributable to the claimant is reduced by the diminishing shareholding in the JV awarded those contracts. So it doesn't get 50% and now gets less. Secondly, we would consider whether the working relationship was ongoing between the parties. In this case, it was not because of the um, actions of the respondent, trust was lost. So the claimant was looking for compensation on profits lost on future contracts as well which would or could have been jointly tendered for and awarded to the JV with the respondent. As an alternative basis, um, the investments made by the claimant in the JV to date could be considered wasted, if not an ongoing long-term business. Now, no, this is an alternative to claiming loss of profits and awarded and future contracts. You cannot, as I've previously mentioned, claim both the cost of the investment and the profits on that investment. Another consideration in this case was that the JV used the name of the claimant in its title. Um, so now the claimant has essentially been pushed out of the JV and has no control of the running of it or the contracts awarded. So if, for example, delays occurred, the claimant can help rectify or mitigate those um, delays. So consideration has to be given as to whether it, um, there was a loss of reputation as well. So that's it on the what. I'm going to hand you back to Michael to cover the when. Next slide, please, Lisa. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, now, when it comes to the valuation date, it's worth noting that this typically depends on the type of loss being assessed. So if we take a look here at a few examples of how this might vary. First of all, a loss of value claim. For example, a claim in which a business has been lost or destroyed. For this type of loss, we typically take the date at which the breach took place as the valuation date, and use information available at that date to assess the value of the loss. Secondly, loss of profits claim. For example, a claim in which a party suffered a loss of profits as a result of, say, a contractual breach. For this type of loss, the valuation date will typically be the date of breach, but can also be the date of award, depending on the specific circumstances of the case, and the loss will be assessed based on the information available at that respective date. Thirdly, a sunk cost claim, for example, a claim in which a party has incurred costs that can't be recovered. For this type of loss, the valuation date will typically be the date of breach, and the loss will be assessed looking at the costs incurred during the investment period. And for our last example, a business interruption loss. And what distinguishes a business interruption loss from the previously mentioned types of losses is that for a business interruption loss, the relevant date is essentially considered to be either once the interruption's ended or once the indemnity period's ended, with the calculation based upon the full period of interruption, thereby making use of all information available up to that date. So having explained how the valuation date may vary depending on the type of loss, let's take a closer look at the impact of choosing between the date of breach and the date of award, which can often be a matter of significant debate when it comes to calculating damages. Next slide, Lisa. Thank you. Now, it's probably already evident 
that the choice of valuation date can have a considerable impact on the valuation amount. And that's because it essentially determines the information to be used in the valuation, both internal information and external, such as movements in commodity prices or rather timely, the impact of a global pandemic. It's for this reason that there should always be a discussion between the expert and the legal team as to the appropriate date to apply, even if it's subsequently determined to be decided by a legal matter or it's determined that there's not an option, which may be the case beyond the realms of investment treaty disputes and acts of unlawful expropriation. However, when there is an option, the alternatives put forward will often be the date of breach or the date of award. In a nutshell, the difference between the two of them primarily relates to the use or not of hindsight. So as to the date of breach, this is often applied given that by using hindsight, it can be argued that this can distort the purpose of the exercise of calculating damages. For example, it might be argued that applying hindsight would permit the evaluation of whether or not risks that existed at the date of the breach have materialized or not which is information the claimant wouldn't have had at the time. Alternatively, it may allow for distortions in the valuation due to the actions of parties following the breach, such as interference, theft of trade secrets, or other anti-competitive behaviors. That being said, there are arguments that the date of award and the use of hindsight can provide a more complete valuation in order to ensure full compensation. And that's given that events may occur after the date of breach that could call into question the appropriateness of assumptions that existed at the date of breach. Now, given that both approaches have been and continue to be accepted, as well as a type of hybrid approach that uses hindsight as a sort of reasonableness check, it's clear that there's no one size fits all response. But rather, this once again comes back to the importance of those, those initial reviews of the specifics of the case and making the decision based on those. And speaking of the specifics, here we can see it's just worth highlighting a few other matters that might influence the decision as to which valuation date to apply. First of all, whether there's a single breach or whether there are multiple breaches as multiple breaches might muddy the water sometimes as somewhat as to how to separate out breaches and their respective impacts at different dates. Second, particularly relevant to investment treaty disputes, whether there have been both lawful and unlawful expropriations, which once again may create an added complexity as to separating them out and their respective impacts at certain dates. And third, losses or benefits which the claimant has been excluded from which only come to light after the date of breach and which, but for considering the period after the date of breach, may not allow the claimant to receive full compensation. And lastly on valuation date, just to explain quite how dramatic an effect the selection of choosing between the date of breach or the date of award can have, on the next slide we set out the change in oil prices over the last 10 years, with oil being a typical commodity that can sit at the heart of a dispute and depending on the valuation date selected, can play a significant role in the final valuation amount. Next slide please Lisa. Thank you. So looking at the shift in oil prices, let's set up an example. Let's say a contractual breach occurs in 2012 when the oil price is around $120. So the claimant decides to use the date of breach in the valuation and basing its valuation on forecasts at that date, i.e. before the oil price crash, it may well forecast long-term oil prices at that level. Now, so the date of award is some three years later, at which point the oil price has crashed and sits close to $60, i.e. half of what it was at the date of breach. Whilst the claimant may have calculated its damages based on an oil price of around $120, which is what it forecast at the date of breach, it would be surprising to say the least if the respondent doesn't dispute this, arguing that the date of award and the use of hindsight would be more appropriate, given that an award based on the date of breach would arguably put the claimant in a significantly better position than it would have been able to achieve, i.e. more than full compensation. Now, having discussed the valuation debt itself and the difference between using the date of breach and date of award, Let's take a quick look at the claim period. Next slide, please, Lisa. Thanks. As was the case with the valuation date, the type of loss being claimed is of particular relevance when it comes to determining the claim period. If we're discussing loss of value for a business that's been lost or destroyed, for example, it can be argued that the period of loss is potentially indefinite as the business will never recover prior profitability. Whereas if we're discussing a loss of profits, we're likely talking about a finite period of time. Now, in some cases, determining the claim period may be relatively simple, such as where there are contractual limitations like the term of a contract. However, in other cases, it may be subject to the discretion of the parties, such as determining the physical or useful life of the company or asset in question. In any case, there are some further matters that will be relevant. First of all, the impact of mitigating actions. In most jurisdictions, the claimants required to take steps to mitigate the extent of a loss, and in some cases, this may well shorten the period of cl the claim period if the actions are effective. Secondly, there's the question of availability of market in that if the availability of the market for the consumption of a good or service is limited to a set period, 
then equally it wouldn't be appropriate to extend the claim period beyond this, even if those goods and services could continue to be produced or provided. And we'll see an example of this in the next case study. And lastly, and perhaps more relevant where the claim period is considered to be potentially indefinite, is a calculation of the terminal value. This is the present value of all future cash flows at a specific point in time. And whilst it's not an issue to discuss in any detail here because it's, it's pretty technical, it's often a point of significant debate in damages calculations, which is worth bearing in mind both in the terminal value calculated and the assumptions that support it. Now, before passing over to Colin to discuss the where, I'll just run you through that quick case study which illustrates the relevance of the when with a particular focus on the importance of assumptions and specifically the determination of the claim period. Next slide, please, Lisa. So this case relates to a coal mine that as a result of a fire was forced to close temporarily and was eventually forced to close permanently. In other words, on the face of it, we're talking about a loss of value due to the destruction or loss of the business. Now, whilst the claimant submitted fairly extensive forecasts, which included continued profitability and a claim period of 15 years based on the capacity of the mine, these forecasts were challenged on a number of matters, in particular, the assumptions of profitability and the claim period. As it turns out, in addition to the coal mine having suffered several years of decreasing profits, which called into question the forecast on profitability, it was also observed that the mine was expected to close within two to three years due to the loss of its available market. And that resulted from various factors, including but not limited to social pressures as to the use of coal. As such, the matter turned from a set of forecasts with an assumption of continued profitability in a 15 year claim period to a detailed analysis of reasonable profitability, and if so, for how long, and the limitation of the claim period up to the date of expected closure of the mine due to the loss of the available market. So in terms of matters to consider, above and beyond the general importance of analyzing the specific nature of the claim, in this particular case, the concept of the claim period and actual useful life became a key matter, with a detailed analysis being performed as to the physical, economical, and social factors relating to the coal mine in order to demonstrate that Whilst the coal mine may have had capacity to continue producing for 15 years, its available market was only likely to exist for a period of two to three years, thereby limiting its claim period. With that, I'll now pass back to Colin to discuss the where. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Michael and Rebecca. Um, so uh, having looked at what the loss is, and when the loss is, and whose loss it is, there are also aspects, if we move on to the next slide, please, Lisa, in terms of actually where are we talking about now a lot of people who are involved in terms of uh, disputes will be familiar with the country risk premium um, and that is essentially an extra amount that is placed onto discount rates typically um, in relation to what's seen as the extra risk for investing in a particular country um, it, can be calculated in a couple of different ways, but the, there are a few um, sources that are fairly typical. Um, beyond that, though, there are a few other issues. So I've put it on here, the currency under which the loss is calculated. And I can give you an example that is public. When we did the standard chartered case uh, against Tanesco, on that case, there was a discussion about whether or not the claim was calculated in Tanzanian shilling or in dollars. Over the period of the claim, the Tanzanian shilling had depreciated very significantly. Um, and in the end, the tribunal decided that it would apply uh, the Tanzanian shilling approach in terms of calculation of the loss, only converting it into dollars as at the date of the award. Uh, that meant that there was a significant percentage of what would otherwise have been allowed that had to be discounted. So the currencies that are actually being claimed uh, can be a very significant factor in terms of looking at your final damages amount. If we move on to the next slide, please. Uh, that's not the only issue that you need to take into account in terms of location impacts. So uh, yes, country risk premium will address the standard political issues, currency convertibility issues, and overall economic issues in a country. But what it doesn't specifically address is some of the points that I've, I've listed here, um, as they would apply to a particular project. So is there actually a local market for the good or the service that is being put out to offer? Um, I had a case that was looking at the supply of gas um, from a gas project 
but actually uh, that gas had no real local marketplace because there wasn't a substantial offtaker of gas in the country, in the city that were involved. Uh, equally, when you look at transport and logistics on that project, it was a long way from where there was a market and would have been extremely difficult to actually transport. So that needed to be factored in. Uh, those are the sort of issues that have to be addressed. Likewise, if you have a mine that is in a remote part of the country, um, you need to consider what the transport capability is because it's not enough to say that you can actually produce from the mine. You need to also say that you can actually take the mineral from the mine to the market. A third issue to remember in terms of location is actually finance. Um, one case I did uh, in relation to a particular country in Africa was actually all around the question of what finance was available. The claimants had stated that they would have been able to finance a particular power plant, and they gave a whole list of sources of finance. Uh, unfortunately, because of the circumstances of that country, uh, those different financial sources were not actually available. Uh, and so that sort of issue has to be taken into account, bearing in mind the project itself and the location. And then finally, geology, uh, this is more specific for some of the natural resource projects, um, but it is something that has to be considered if you have uh, nearby projects that have geology that might be problematic, is that going to impact a project that you're looking at? It may not do, but it needs to be something that uh, uh, you are aware of and considering as part of developing a case. Now, if we can move on to the next slide, I will pass you back to Michael. Thanks, Colin. If we move to the next slide, please, Isa. Thanks. So when it comes to determining the specific approach to calculating the loss, this will typically depend on a number of factors, including not just the subject matter, but also, and of particular importance, the information available and the reliability of that information. And the potential impact of these factors makes those early conversations between experts, legal teams, and counsel invaluable, particularly as this will be expected, the choice of calculation approach can have a significant impact on the loss amount. So as to the approaches that can be applied, firstly, turning to valuation approaches, you'll typically see the use of one of three, the income-based approach, the market-based approach, and the asset or cost-based approach. So we're just gonna take a quick look at each one of these and their limitations because as you're probably well aware, no, no approach is, is by any means perfect. So first up, the income-based approach. This is a, a forward-looking approach commonly used because it can be applied to any company or project that's got reliable projections of future income. The approach involves estimating future cash flows from the company or the project and then discounting these back to the net present value by applying a discount rate. Now, whilst this by no means a hard and fast rule and would obviously depend on the specifics of the claim, the income-based approach is, is typically favored given that it, it is said to adequately capture the value of future operations and uses assumptions that are explicit. And that means that they can be varied or considered separately, which is particularly helpful when a court or tribunal may wish to modify a specific variable. However, despite the common use of the income-based approach, it does come with certain limitations. Firstly, as found by the tribunal, and you can see on screen here in, in Frank Charles West Moldova, it's not appropriate for a business that's never operated and where a satisfactory basis for projected revenues has not been demonstrated. Secondly, it's highly dependent on assumptions which can be subject to challenge. And that can be in terms of the forward-looking assumptions used in terms of determining the future cash flows, those assumptions used in determining the discount rate, or the assumptions used in, term in calculating the terminal value, which can often represent a large proportion of the total loss calculated. Next up, the market approach. So this approach is based on the idea that similar assets should sell for a similar price in the market. As such, it values a company by multiplying a relevant metric for the company by a multiple based on similar assets or companies, whether through trading multiples, such as multiples based on EBITDA, which is earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, amortization, or transaction multiples, such as the acquisition price for a comparable transaction. However, despite being a preferred method, again, given its simplicity and ease of use, as is the case with the income method, it does have its limitations. Firstly, it's considered to be impractical, where there's only there's 
few, if any, comparables exist. And that can be seen in the case of CMS Gas vs Argentina, whereby it was called a most speculative enterprise in this regard. Secondly, it's difficult to apply to private companies due to the limitation of information. And thirdly, unlike the income-based approach, it relies on implicit assumptions. And this may draw criticism as subject to the application of suitable adjustments. It may not be appropriate to assume that one business operating in the same sector, subject to the same influences, is equal to another business in the same sector subject to different influences, and that can likely affect the valuation. Lastly, we have the asset-based or cost-based approach. This approach is based on the idea that an asset's value is at least equal to the cost of purchasing or constructing a substitute. It essentially provides a floor, a floor value. This approach looks to value a company on the basis of the value of its assets less its liabilities, and can be done either using the liquidated value, which is the value of the assets that remain if the company goes out of business, the book value, which is the value according to the balance sheet, or the adjusted book value, which is essentially the book value adjusted to true market value. And in terms of limitations with this exercise, whilst there's a number, perhaps the most important is that the asset-based approach disregards a company's prospective future earnings, such that, as identified in CMS Gas for Argentina, it wouldn't be appropriate in circumstances in which the subject is a company with a record of profits. This is why it's often considered as providing that floor value and little more. In this way, whilst it is sometimes applied as a contractually agreed approach, which means there's no other alternative, it's widely accepted that it's unlikely to capture the full value of the subject matter. Now, in respect to these three approaches, it's just worth noting that whilst one can often be used as a comparative or sense check for another, and this is often the case which happens with experts, or indeed all three or more approaches may be offered as alternatives or to provide a range, there is evidence to suggest that this scattergun approach can at times, if not applied correctly, actually detract from the value or worth placed by the courts, the tribunal on the approach put forward. So that's the income market and asset-based valuation approaches. And whilst these approaches are typically the most commonly applied, there are a number of other valuation and non-valuation approaches that may be referred to, subject to the specific nature of the matter at hand. I'll just talk through a couple of these if um, we pass them to the next slide, Lisa. Thanks. So whilst this is an exhaustive list by any means, these are some of the more common approaches or common other approaches that might exist. First of all, the wasted cost approach. This is an assessment that's taken of costs incurred by a party that suffered the act or breach that are considered to be wasted as a result of the act or breach. Next up, the return of investment approach. And this looks at the efficiency or profitability of the investment and can be used to determine a reasonable rate of interest to apply to the costs incurred in the investment in order to determine its value, but for the act or breach. And lastly, loss of opportunity, whereby alternative opportunities to the investment undertaken which suffered the act of breach are considered in order to determine what returns the claimant would have obtained elsewhere. So there we have it, a quick run through of the how and just some of the approaches that can be taken in calculating losses. Now, before finishing up, I've just got one more case study on this matter, which illustrates the complexities of choosing the appropriate approach to take. You pass on to the next slide. Thank you, Lisa. So this case relates to a series of investments in renewable energy plants undertaken by a foreign investor on the understanding that it would be offered a set tariff on the output of the plants. However, shortly after entering into operation, the government impl implemented changes to the tariffs which significantly reduced the value of the investment. As to the issues, at the date for the implementation of the tariff changes, the plants had only been in operation for a short period of time, thereby calling into question the suitability of an income-based approach due to the lack of reliable forecasts. Now, generally speaking, as we've mentioned, an income-based approach can be applied to a company or project that has reliable projections of future income. However, in this instance, there were limited operating records and the forecasts put forward were argued to be insufficient and unreliable, particularly in light of the long useful life of the plants, which was some 40 years. However, given on the one hand the unique nature of the investment, and on the other hand, the fact that the investment had been undertaken on the basis that the government had allegedly guaranteed positive economic returns, it was considered that a market-based approach wouldn't be suitable on the grounds of lack of comparables, whilst an asset-based approach wouldn't be suitable in order to fully compensate the investor. So as a result, the claimant sought additional data through external studies and other sources in order to support an income-based approach, arguing that the future cash flows could in fact be reliably estimated. And this approach convinced the tribunal, which considered the income-based approach in this instance to be most appropriate on the basis that the method of quantifying future cash flows was not particularly complex and that said cash flows could therefore be forecast. However, just one final word of warning on this case in particular, the tribunal did dispute the claimant's proposed useful life estimates and revised the valuation accordingly for a shorter useful life, which just goes back to the when and the appropriate claim period.
So with that, I'll, I'll hand back to Colin and that's the end of the how. Thank you. So um, if we look at the key takeaways before handing over to Seb, um, if we can move on to the next slide, please, Lisa. Uh, when we talk about who, early identification of the claimant can actually help in terms of adapting the case strategy. And this is for the claimant, but also it does apply for the respondent. Um, uh, and it's just understanding what issues you may face with the damages right at the start will help you in terms of making sure that you've got the right parties in, the, in what you're putting forward in your pleadings. That question of what, because there are different ways of framing a loss um, and because the information available varies very much from case to case, it's a question of identifying what is possible legally, what is also possible practically, and what is most appropriate. Um, moving then on to the when, um, we've touched on what, how that can make such a big difference. But it is often in practice an issue that for the legal team isn't black and white. There may be different dates that could be chosen in terms of what's actually treated as the breach or whether there's a, a sort of an ongoing cumulative set of breaches. So those are the sort of issues to be gone through there. Um, in terms of the where, it's just being aware of the different broader issues that that can actually bring for the uh, quantification of the damages. And finally, with the how, just to remember that there are these different options. It's not always agreed, even between valuation experts or damages experts, uh, how to, which approach to use, or indeed how to actually apply each approach. Um, so it's worth having an understanding early on of what issues might be faced on that. And with that, Seb, I think over to you. Thank you very much. Colin, uh, Michael, and Rebecca for the insightful presentation on what lawyers have to consider when assessing the damages in international arbitration cases. And also thank you very much, Professor Paparinskis and UCL for the invitation to the today's talk. Before I commence with my concluding remarks, um, I highlight that the portrayed views are my personal views and not the ones of my employer. Having said that, when we look at arbitration awards, the expression last but not least is one that is all to be applied in this context. Although damages are typically dealt with at the end of an award, the assessment of quantum arguably warrants the highest importance because it is these commercial considerations that are the ones driving arbitral and judicial proceedings for both internal and as well external stakeholders. For instance, lawyers may be, will be fairly familiarized with the question that a claimant or defendant may post at the beginning of the proceedings, which is, how much is this going to cost me, or how much, money am, how much money am I going to make from this? While for external stakeholders, such as litigation funders or, for example, insurers, quantum decides whether an investment becomes financially viable or if there's any risk exposure at all, depending where an insurer attached at the insurance tower. So in short, Quantum decides whether a victory in the legal field amounts as well to a commercial win outside of the legal proceedings. So therefore, considering the importance um, of this has, that this has for commercial proceedings, it is interesting to see a remark that was highlighted by the PWC report in conjunction with Queen Mary on damages awards in international commercial arbitration, which illustrates that only 12% of the damages claimed in arbitration awards are awarded by tribunals at the end of it. An extreme example is illustrated by the case of Beer Creek Mining versus Peru, where UCL's very own Philip Sands sat as an arbitrator. Here, the claimant sought to recover 522 million US dollars, and at the end, the tribunal only granted them 18.5 million US dollars. It is worth highlighting that in the dissenting opinion of Philip Sands, the right amount would have only, should have only amounted to 9.5 million which in turns means that the claimant only recovered 
3.5 or 2% of the initially claimed amount. This seems fairly radical if we look at, uh, at it from this point of view. However, if we look at the rationale that the tribunal provided in that case, it makes a bit more sense, specifically considering what was highlighted in today's presentation. For example, the claimant was a mining company with a concession contract to extract silver in Peru, and they based their calculation of damages in the income method, projecting stable silver prices and also the, all other sorts of assumptions that were fairly positive for a length of over 20 years. However, they hadn't even started with the project itself on the one hand side, which meant that they didn't have a reliable track record that was then applicable to the assumptions. And just by way of example, um, the assumption of stable silver, ply, of silver prices. In the year 2013 to 14, there was a fluctuation of minus 35%. In other natural resources, I don't think we need to remind ourselves of what happened with oil prices this summer, where they reached a historical low, and that wasn't surely the case in any sort of projection of international arbitration cases before. So considering how important this subject is lawyers were able to understand these dynamics and implement them in their case strategy will have a considerable advantage because they will be a be able to provide a more accurate prediction of what a claimant or defendant may expect in their calculation of damage and through that be able to add additional value to their services which seems to be the holy grail of private practice in these modern times However, the legal field of calculation of damages is one that remained fairly unexplored and at times not yet entirely satisfactory. Take, for instance, the field of creeping expropriation, which is when the state gradually, through wrongful acts in forms of legislations, regulations or taxations, may cause an investment to fail. Although these wrongful acts are actions solely implemented by governments or defendants in this case, they're ILC does not grant full reparation in this case, which seems to be somewhat of a disconnect between the theory and a practice and raises an array of questions in this context. Although I would love to go into more detail of the field of creeping expropriation, the limited scope of today's presentation does not allow us to go into more detail, but I thoroughly recommend the article that was written by today's moderator, Professor Paparinskis, and that was published on last summer in Modern Law Review, so feel free to read it and gain more insights from that. However, the point uh, on lack of understanding and application of quantums is, for instance, illustrated as well in other cases. Take, for example, Time Bier versus Argentina, where the tribunal awarded uh, 320 million US dollars to the claimant. But if we look at the award itself, only 30 pages of it were dedicated to the question of quantum on an award that consisted of 500 pages. That's around 6% of the entirety of it. And it's worth highlighting that the claimant initially sought to recover 1.2 billion. So at the end of it, they only recovered I thought of it. So I remember back uh, my days in private practice and I thought that an analogy of saying that if you work very hard on a case and you record all your time, however, you don't submit it at the end, means that you lose a significant effort that you put in it. The same applies in this context. If you already won the case in jurisdiction and in merits and you can see the price at the end of the line, why not push for it adequately and achieve the results that you are seeking for? However, this light at the end of the tunnel, I like to say, because more recent cases show that tribunals and the parties involved in such proceedings are becoming more sophisticated in understanding the relevance of quantum and adapting their case strategy accordingly. This was very much highlighted in the presentation by the College of HFK, all the arguments that play an interplay on that. And that can be reflected as well, for example, in arguments that are raised during the stage of merits that then feed into what is raised on the quantum stage. For example, when is the applicable date for damages? But it may also be the case in terms of allocation of resources for a case, which means working very closely with quantum experts from the offset of the case. Or, for example, in the question of the selection of an arbitrator, if you're raising a very complex argument on quantum and you feel more comfortable with an arbitrator who has experience of that, it might lead you to the commercial victory we referred to before. So to conclude, 
ultimately, getting the quantum aspect right is the element that is most important to your client. As I referred at the beginning, the first question that we, you will be most likely to be asked is, how much will this cost me? How much am I going to recover from this? So lawyers who understand the elements of quantum and collaborate with experts in the field will A, add significant value to the services by providing more accurate estimation and shifting the focus to what matters to the clients most, the financial proceeds. B, have a differentiating factors to their competitors, because as you've seen, this is still a field that is yet to be developed and having a key understanding of it means that you will have something where you can gain additional value. And last but not least, from an academic and intellectual standpoint, being able, to, being able to be involved in this field that is yet to be shaped is something that appears to me as a very interesting prospect. So in that sense, I say thank you very much for the presentation of HFK to UCL again and to the audience. I hope that you enjoyed today's presentation and I pass back to Professor Paparinskis. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sebastian, for a very insightful comments. Uh, thank you, uh, Colin, Rebecca and Michael for uh, the analytically sharp dissection of this complex field, uh, building on the wealth of practice that uh, listeners can fully uh, gleam on the CVs on our website. I think it was absolutely an absolutely fantastic event. Let me just conclude with one of my uh, sort of favorite uh, anecdotes on the topic, not my own, but that of a great figure in the field, uh, Judge James Crawford from his American Society's Grotius lecture from a few years ago, uh, where he was uh, telling uh, of a conversation that he had had with a student who had said that uh, the student, not Judge Crawford, was very interested in obligations in investment law, but he did not uh, much uh, care for quantum. Uh, Judge Crawford said that, you know, he had responded that in his experience, uh, clients generally did not share that perspective. Uh, and I think uh, tonight's uh, talk uh, is an absolute evidence that, uh, well, Judge Crawford is rightly on the International Court of Justice. Uh, it was a pleasure to have all of you. It was really a pleasure to have such a fantastically large uh, crowd of listeners with us. Have a very nice evening wherever you are. <laughs>